All right, chemists, uh, in this lesson, we're going to talk about whether or not we can get a precipitate to form from a reaction that we would normally expect to form an insoluble precipitate, and then go over a couple of ways that chemists use to actually dissolve very insoluble substances. We're going to find that we come full circle and bring it back to complex ions, which is the first thing we learned about in this unit. So first of all, remember talk about any equilibrium process. We have the expression for the equilibrium constant, but we can also talk about the uh, reaction quotient, uh, which is abbreviated with a capital Q. That's useful for these types of processes as well when we look at solubility equilibria. So let's say we have some volume of some molarity of a silver ion, and we mix it with some volume of some molarity of a chloride ion, keeping in mind that we know nitrate is always a spectator, sodium is always a spectator. We should recognize that it's possible silver and chloride can come together to form a precipitate. So the net ionic reaction that occurs in theory is silver ion, Ag plus, plus chloride ion, Cl minus, to make AgCl. And in the first semester of this class, we would all agree, yep, that's exactly what you get. But remember, even these very insoluble precipitates have some solubility. If it's very, very dilute, you could get it to go into solution. Again, this might be something that an environmental chemist might be interested to figure out, or at least for us, an AP chemist. So to do this, we can look at the KSP value for silver chloride and compare it with where we are at this point. We're gonna start by getting the concentrations of each ion after they've mixed, but before any hypothetical reaction has happened. So the silver ion concentration, just modifying the dilution equation, is going to be how many moles of silver ion we have divided by the total volume, assuming volumes are additive, which in this low concentration, they should be. So the molarity is 3 times 10 to the negative 3 from up above. The volume is 100, and we are diluting it to 300. Again, that 300 is the sum of the two volumes once they've been added. And without a calculator, that just gives us 10 to the negative 3 molar of the Ag plus ion. Uh, the chloride ion is almost exactly the same thing. The chloride, I'm just going to squeeze it in down here, is its molarity. Its source is the NaCl, so that's 3 times 10 to the negative 3 times 200, and then divided by the same total. So we get 3 times 10 to the negative 3 divided, uh, times 200 divided by 300. And I'm not even going to write that out. That turns into 2 times 10 to the negative 3 molar chloride. Just doing the same process analogously. So will a precipitate form? Well, we're given the KSP of silver chloride, and that goes with its dissociation. AgCl becomes Ag plus and Cl minus. The reaction quotient, which we actually call the ion product, is the same expression as the equilibrium constant. So it's the concentration of silver ion times chloride ion, which we just figured out, 10 to the minus 3 and 2 times 10 to the minus 3. That gives us 2 times 10 to the negative 6 which is greater than the KSP value. And remember, just like comparing any value of Q with the value of K for a given process, in this case, a solid, when Q is larger than K, uh, the reaction shifts to the left. So if I look at this equilibrium as if it's a reaction, we're making more of the solid AgCl. So AgCl will precipitate will precipitate because we're above the solubility. If we had, we're actually not that far, we're actually several orders of magnitude above um, by four, but you can imagine making even more dilute mixtures of this and being below the solubility and getting it to dissolve. So what if we compare the precipitation of one solid with another? Let's say there's two possibilities. I've got a flask that's got 0.1 molar chloride and 0.01 molar chromate. And I'm going to slowly add silver ion in the form of silver nitrate to that mixture. Question is, which one precipitates first? So for the AgCl, 
our concentration of silver ion in order to form a precipitate would be the KSP of AgCl, which is given right up above, divided by the concentration of chloride. I know the chloride concentration. I know the KSP of HCl. I don't know what silver ion concentration it will require. And you can imagine having some mixture of these two ions present in some container. You've got both Cl minus and chromate, and you could, you could slowly add a source of silver. The first one to precipitate will be the one that's at the lower silver ion concentration. So we're going to figure out what it is for each of one, compare, and the lower one should give us that solubility. So for AgCl, when I do that, I get 1.8 times 10 to the minus 10, just using the KSP up above, divided by 0 0.10. And that's 1.8 to 10 minus 9 molar. And what I'd like you to do is hit pause and try to do the same thing except for the other possible product, which would be silver chromate, which is Ag2CrO4. How could you calculate the silver ion concentrated needed to form a precipitate of that? Okay, if you tried it, you probably started with setting up the same expression. It's the KSP of the solid that I could possibly form, silver chromate, divided by the concentration of this time chromate. However, you have to think about what the KSP of silver chromate would look like. Because there's two silvers, the KSP would actually be equal to the product of chromate times silver ion squared. So this expression that we have here works, but it's only for the silver ion squared, which means if I want silver ion as is, I have to take the square root of that uh, ratio. So if I plug in our numbers, I get the square root of the KSP up above for silver chromate is 10 to the negative 12 divided by the chromate 0 0.010. Nice numbers in these problems, no calculator needed. Uh, we get 10 to the minus 5 molar. So now we get to compare which one will hit first. And if you're starting with a concentration of no silver, you're going to hit the lower molarity first as you slowly add silver ion. So precipitation occurs at the lower silver ion concentration, which means I've got a lower value for AGCL, so AGCL will precipitate first. Okay, so that's a little bit about forming precipitates from dilute solutions and then predicting precipitates if you've got the possibility of multiple things precipitating out, all using those KSP expressions and numerical values of KSP, which are tabulated for solids. We're going to switch gears now and talk about dissolving precipitates. How do we force these things to go back into solution other than just diluting them with a whole lot of water? We can do this chemically. There's two main ways. The first one is reacting them with acids. Most acids have the potential uh, to dissolve precipitates. So let's say I have a strong acid um, and I want to react it with an aluminum hydroxide solid, which is an insoluble solid. That would give me uh, H plus reacting with aluminum hydroxide. Now you can think of this as any acid-base reaction where we just happen to have three hydroxides, but each one will occupy, uh, will take up an H plus ion and you'll get a water molecule. And as a result, aluminum ion. But since I have three hydroxides, I'm gonna need three H pluses, which means I'm gonna actually make three water molecules. And that's perfect, that actually balances the reaction. So hit pause again and try this with the other two. What would happen if you mixed calcium carbonate with H plus and then cobalt two sulfide with H plus? And we'll see if you can identify a trend in why these precipitates dissolve. Okay, calcium carbonate or chalk plus H plus will give off a calcium ion. And remember from last semester, carbonates plus acid, 
That's how you make carbon dioxide. It's a common gas forming reaction. Where did the hydrogen and the rest of the oxygen go? It made water. And really these two things came from carbonic acid, H2CO3. So if you wrote H2CO3 initially, you're not wrong, but that actually turns into CO2 and H2O very favorably. Just to balance it, it'll require two H pluses, and then that takes care of everything. The cobalt-2 sulfide will also create a metal ion. So that's the trend here. We made an aluminum ion, then a calcium ion, then a cobalt ion. And what's left over? Uh, the sulfide is what's going to pick up the hydrogen ions, and you'll make hydrogen sulfide, H2S, which means I need two H pluses. And in each of these cases, you're actually forming a weak acid. We're making water in the first two and hydrogen sulfide in the other two. So forming a weak acid is favorable. Weak acids don't dissociate very much, so they can combine to form fairly stable molecules. This would not work if I wanted to dissolve something that would theoretically give me a strong acid. You can imagine trying this with, let's say, silver chloride. That does not work. If I try to mix this with H+, I can't make silver ion because the byproduct would have to be HCl. And as we know, HCl is a strong acid and that doesn't form. So this actually only works when we have an anion that's the conjugate of a weak acid because then it can form a weak acid in each case. So what do we do when we have things that don't dissolve an acid? The most common answer to that is we use complex ions. So we're going full circle and showing how complex ions can actually dissolve insoluble precipitates. So consider the reaction of silver chloride with ammonia to make the complex ion, the silver ammonia complex, and then left over a chloride. The first thing is we need a value of K for this reaction, given a KSP and a KF, the formation of the complex. So let's write what each of those K values represents. A KSP for a solid is simply the dissociation of that solid. So AgCl barely dissociates into a silver ion and a chloride ion. And the silver ammonia complex, that's a formation constant. So I'm going to combine a silver ion and two ammonias. So silver ion plus two ammonias very favorably forms the silver ammonia complex. Don't forget that plus charge. Now these two reactions, if you look at them, they can actually add together to get the net reaction that we want in the original problem. The silver ion cancels and you're left with exactly the reaction that you want. When two reactions add to give a net reaction, the K values will multiply to give the net equilibrium constant. So the K for this net equilibrium after combining these two would be the product of the KSP, which is 1.8 times 10 to the negative 10 for the first one, and then 1.7 times 10 to the seven for the second one. Good reminder that KSPs are typically very small, whereas formation constants for complex ions are typically very large. And this gives us something that's mediocre. We get 3.1 times 10 to the minus 3 for that net reaction. Now, how can we use this? Well, we're going to dissolve some amount of silver chloride in a whole lot of ammonia. So let's rewrite that reaction. Silver chloride, it's right up above it, plus 2 ammonias can form the complex ion and a chloride ion. And if we think about an abbreviated rice chart for this, we have six molar of the ammonia initially, and none of the silver ammonia and none of the chloride. But this is going to react with some amount of the silver chloride. We're trying to find how much of this can I put in. This is a solid, though, so it's not in the equilibrium expression. So I don't need to worry about quantitatively what it is in my rice chart. I just know however much of the ammonia reacts, it's going to be proportional to how much silver ion I can put in. 
So, so far I have zero of the complex and zero of the chloride, which means I'm going to gain some of each of those and I'm going to lose some amount of my ammonia, but it's a two to one ratio. This is not one to one. So it's actually six minus two X. And I can set up an equilibrium expression. The K that we just calculated is 3.1 times 10 to the negative three. That's X squared all over six minus two X. And don't forget that's also squared. And then that's because of the coefficient. And this two X is not negligible compared to six. It, it might be, but it's likely not. That's not very small of a K value, K value. So you might think, do we need a quadratic in this case? And you could do that, but luckily this is a perfect square. So we're just gonna take the square root of both sides and I'm not gonna show the math, but when you do that, you get a value of X, uh, which happens to be about 0 0.30. And it's one liter of this molarity. So these actually were mole values. So that's six moles, which means I have 0 0.3 moles of AGCL will dissolve. So, that's how we calculate and qualitatively figure out how we dissolve precipitates. And that just follows how we form precipitates. Will it form and are they selective?